So Conquer Gravity Dams. Uh, originally, this is going to be a 30-minute topic. Now I have 12 minutes officially. I'm going to try to make this go as quickly as possible. So a lot of the information that uh, Tom was providing uh, really applies to this uh, presentation as well. Uh, most gravity dam failures, when they do fail, at least uh, more recent ones, you know, it's a lot of times it's because of a foundation defect. Um, so there's a, a very strong relationship between, you know, your geological features and your uh, structural stability features in terms of uh, what's, what's going to lead to a failure. So the learning objectives of this presentation, first, uh, identify the mechanisms that affect uh, gravity structures, how to construct different event trees, and how to estimate those nodal probabilities. Um, so this presentation is focusing on internal and global stability failure modes. So internal failure modes, all it really means is like a structural failure mode um, through like a, a lift joint. So we'll hit on that again. Um, the other two primary uh, focuses of stability analysis are at the concrete rock interface, as well as some deep con uh, deep seated uh, failure plane discontinuity through the rock mass. Um, but we're just going to focus on everything that's at the concrete rock interface and above. Um, so what are the key concepts? So obviously gravity structures are relying on the mass for stability. Uh, that's why they're called gravity structures. So again, they're normally designed, so everything's in compression. You start having problems whenever uh, that is no longer true uh, due to PMF updates or uh, seismic loading. Uh, weak lift joints are obviously a big issue. Um, so the foundation rock interface is typically a lot stronger than people give it credit for. So whenever you do review construction photographs, you will see... Uh, you know, large um, disparities in the in the uh, on the foundation surface itself. So those eye angles, those disparities, those also have to be considered in your foundation strengths um, in design. They're typically ignored. Um, so that's one of the key takeaways here. We're looking for the expected strengths, not some conservative design strength in a risk assessment. Um, so the drains are the first line of defense, and we'll, we'll get to a slide um, in a little bit. Um, whenever you're doing a risk assessment, oftentimes whenever we're dealing with cracked bases, we have to consider what are, what's the effect of that crack on the, the uplift. Does it reduce the drain? So right now, uh, you know, kind of the conservative approach is as soon as your uh, base cracks, you just ignore the drains. That's an extremely conservative – well, I wouldn't say extremely. I'm sorry. It is a conservative assumption – um, that's really not appropriate for a risk assessment. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit. Um, and then also the 3D effects that Tom kind of mentioned, you know, they're at play here too. So whenever we're performing a, a stability analysis, typically it's a 2D model, uh, but then whenever we create the event tree, we create an extra node at the end that's 3D effects. And for like an SQRA or an early risk assessment, a screening type risk assessment, we're going to look at this qualitatively. Sometimes we can put some uh, raw numbers to it. Most of the time, we're just going to look at what we have. Um, so this would be a condition where you have excellent 3D effects. So if one monolith has poor conditions, but its neighboring monoliths do not have poor conditions, um, for whatever reason, maybe it's the uplift issues, maybe one monolith uh, has poor drains or something happened, there's damage, it's more likely to slide. Well, if it can hang on to the neighboring monoliths and those neighboring monoliths have enough capacity to not slide downstream, it can save the day. Um, so if you have, th this would be an example of like unreinforced uh, shear keys, right? So there are case histories. Uh, so the Boise Dam in France, um, essentially, long story short, uh, there, were, there were some leakage noted whenever they started filling the reservoir. Um, you know, they reinforced it, they tried to make repairs, and when they filled it again, uh, the top half of the dam snapped off. It's an example of an internal failure mode here. Um, the other one that's kind of more popular, more, uh, more, more well-known is the Konya Dam uh, in India. There was a seismic event uh, with a PGA estimate of um, somewhere between like 0.5 and 0.6 Gs uh, that, that occurred at the site. And it did not fail, but it experienced significant damage. Uh, the transition zone uh, where the batter changes uh, slopes. You can see kind of about two-thirds up on the dam. So th this dam had kind of a unique 
um, upper third, where it's a little bit more narrow than we typically see. So most of our non-overflow monoliths are a little bit more robust than what you see here, and that kind of played into the the uh, stresses that we observed um, at this dam. So again, this is about a 0.5 G event. It cracked. Uh, it a crack developed at that. Uh, change in geometry, so that's where the highest stress was. The 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 dam was overstressed by about 20% or so, and it caused a crack. Um, but again, it didn't fail. Uh, but it you know they they did have to uh, make significant repairs to it afterward. So what are our, what are the differences between design and risk analysis? Most people um, who take this class uh, they're very familiar with the design aspects. But then they got to learn uh, how to change their mindset for risk analysis. So an analysis, it's deterministic. You're getting a value. Your shear strengths, you know, you get one value. It's typically a lower bound value. Um, you're using factors of safety for your stability, and that factor of safety can change. It can be 1.1 or 1.3 for extreme events. Um, it can be 1.8 or 3 if you're using FERC projects and uh, using cohesion. These factors of safety, you know, they're all prescriptive by the dam owner typically. Um, we're not using those um, factors of safety for risk analysis. So you got to get comfortable with actually understanding what is safe and what that factor of safety is really meaning. Um, in design, of course, you're not accounting for side friction. Um, you're normally taking some type of uh, conservative drainage assumption. Oftentimes you'll see 30% drainage efficiencies or no more than 60 or 67% uh, allowed by your dam owner. Well, we're not doing that for a risk assessment. For a risk assessment, we're going in, we want to see the uplift sill data. If you don't have uplift sill data, um, but you have drains, um, you're going to use your best judgment. You're going to use historical performance. You're going to use physics-based approaches to try to figure out what that uplift distribution under the dam is. You're not just arbitrarily going to set a 30% drainage efficiency on a dam, or you'll go through a sensitivity analysis because oftentimes the structural engineer shouldn't be the one that's determining what the drainage efficiency under the dam is. But you can run a sensitivity from zero to 100% drainage efficiency at every 10%, for example, and you can present that information and get everybody in a room and discuss what's most appropriate to use on your dam. Um, so past performance isn't typically considered. Um, so whenever we look at a risk analysis, um, most of the time we're, we're focusing in on critical um, reservoir loads, right? So most of the time your dam, again, is that PMF load. So you select, say, a top of active storage. You see how frequent that loading is. You look at your factors of safety. If you're safe with that assumption, then you'll look at a top of dam or, uh, you know, right up to overtopping. And you, you have to consider that loading probability um, in your stability analysis. We have dams where the PMF is 20, overtopping the dam by 20 feet. It's a 10 billion year event. So are we concerned about that event? Not now, like maybe in 100 years when we fix every other dam, we need to look at this dam that's overtopping by 20 feet. But, you know, whenever you start looking at the top of dam loading, it's less than PMF, it's still a million year event. So we have dams that need have problems at a 10,000 year event. So that's why we're really focusing in on these loading frequencies as well. Um, and I cover drain efficiency. Um, sometimes, you know, you have to make a site visit, see what kind of uh, damage is on the dam. Um, you know, there's a lot of considerations that you have in a risk assessment that you don't have uh, in design. So this is really the most important uh, topic, I guess, in this whole um, presentation that I just want to spend some time on. So a cracked base analysis. So when you get that crack, under your dam. So you have so much loading that you no longer have compression at the heel. The most common assumption that we make now is that the heel cracks. For an internal failure plane, that's generally conservative because you're going to have a tensile capacity of your uh, concrete unless you know you have an un unbonded joint or you know that you have reasons to believe that that you know, joints become unbonded if you don't have test data. So if you're looking at, say, the concrete rock interface and you don't know how well prepared this foundation contact was, most of the time 
uh, you're just going to assume that that base is cracked. And so once the base cracks, you're going to get full reservoir uplift under the heel. So now you no longer have a linear stability analysis. Now you have to iterate through a process where you increase the uplift that's under the heel and you allow, you see how much further out that resultant was pushed towards the toe. And so what happens, it increases the crack length, more uplift, you push the resultant further and further out. So you have to iterate through this. So oftentimes for a well-proportioned dam, that crack will stabilize at, um, say you have a loading of a thousand feet, just making up numbers here. Well, that crack stabilizes at six feet. Well, once you go up to 1,001 feet, now that crack has grown to 20 something feet. And so normally that crack will continue to propagate as you continue to increase um, the load on that reservoir. So where this becomes problematic is what do you do with the drainage efficiencies under that dam? So this crack is continuing across the foundation and then it's eventually gonna intersect these uh, drains. So kind of the common assumption that we make right now, as you can see in kind of the, uh, let's say the second and third rows here in the third column, once that crack has intersected the drains, most of our codes are simply saying, assume the drains are no longer efficient. So this is a conservative assumption, but we just don't have data to say otherwise, right? Re you can reasonably look at it and say, it's not really reasonable. You have holes in the bottom of your dam, even though you have full reservoir, those holes are relieving, relieving pressure. So if you're designing something, yeah, ignore them. That's fine. It's conservative. I'd ignore them in a design, but for a risk assessment, that's not truly what happens. So once you're, you, you have to really pay attention to how far uh, this crack is propagating under your dam. And then what are you going to do, or what are you going to do with the uplift assumptions once it happens? So most software um, that you're going to use is going to just simply ignore those drains, but there are methods to actually consider the uh, pressure relief from those drains once that crack has uh, propagated past that drain line. And it's simply just looking at, you know, if your base cracks, you essentially have um, some asperity or uh, some uh, some crack width um, that you need to uh, essentially do hydraulic calculations for. So you're going to say, okay, you have a crack uh, width of just you know a fraction of an inch, and then as this water is flowing underneath the dam, it's going to intersect these drains that could be four or six inches in diameter, and they're spaced at uh, six to twelve feet on center, whatever they end up being. There's going to be a lot of uh, pressure relief at that point. Um, so in a risk assessment, this is typically what we start doing once we know uplift considerations are important. However, doing that kind of analysis is tedious. So again, you are trying to gearing your, um, your risk analysis uh, to what you need. So what I mean is um, assume the drains are gone, run it. If you don't have any problems, then you don't need to do this analysis. Um, we've talked about uh, lift joints before, but essentially what all this is saying is just because you have leaking joints doesn't mean you have an unbonded lift joint. A lot of our uh, dam lift joints crack, or not crack, they leak, and once we core through them, they are still bonded. Uh, and vice versa is true. Just because you don't have leaks from joints does not necessarily indicate that that, um, that lift joint is bonded. So again, you have to use engineering judgment. You have to consider other considerations, uh, how they prepare the lift joint, the history of the dam, were there seismic, was there a seismic activity historically, um, things like that. So what's an event tree look like for a stability um, analysis model? So again, this, this event tree is kind of, I can't even see it, hold on. So what we have here is we start with a load range and then we have a sliding instability node and this is a very simple event tree. What's missing are the 3D effects. So we don't have sliding uh, 3D effects um, in this event tree um, directly, but 90% of your event trees will end up needing it because just because one monolith is sliding doesn't mean the dam is failing. However, what if your dam has the same foundation condition across the entire axis? Are you gonna get 3D effects in that case? Of course not. 
So if every single one of your models has a factor of safety of one, which we're just saying the, the loads are exactly what the, the resistances are in this dam, if, if you have 10 monoliths and nine of them have uh, reached this point, your 3D effects are gonna be pretty insignificant. But let's say you have one or two monoliths that are sliding, but the other ones are pretty stable, then it's gonna have a huge reduction on your, um, on your APF, your, your SRP. So sliding stability isn't just a static condition. It's not a, you know, it's not, we're not just concerned with a simple PMF loading. Um, sometimes there are other uh, failure modes that can tie into uh, stability failure mode. So this is an example of, let's say, an erosion type failure mode where you have overtopping, or it could be just a spillway monolith um, but once the gates, maybe it's a project that's never seen spillway flow, you open the gates, the flip bucket, the ceiling basin, something fails, you expose the underlying rock, now you have down cutting at the, uh, at the toe of the dam, and that's going to produce a failure. So your dam is stable without erosion, but once this erosion starts to down cut under the foundation, you start to become unstable. So you can develop event trees for something like um, that as well. Then of course, with your seismic risks, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so the industry is kind of, it's, there's still not an exact answer on like what the proper procedure is on, you know, how much work do you need to do for a seismic analysis for a risk assessment? Some people skip the dynamic analysis portion. They go straight to saying, let's just assume everything cracks and fails and let's look at a post earthquake condition. However, again, that's a conservative approach so when you're in a risk assessment and you really got to figure out what the probability of failure is, you end up having some pretty gnarly looking event trees where you're looking at what happens if the section cracks. So you're gonna have a higher probability if your concrete cracks. Um, and this one in particular is for a concrete rock interface. And so if your concrete rock interface is cracked and your drains are disrupted, uh, what's your stability post earthquake? So the shaking's done, everything's cracked, maybe things have shifted downstream. And so you still have the same uh, hydrological loading. So what are we gonna look at uh, there in terms of nodal probabilities? So I'm gonna skip ahead just to kind of talk about that a little bit. So for that one node, your drains are interrupted. You might do an analysis that looks like this. This is a new mark type analysis. So this would be an analysis where you're actually, again, taking that time history, putting it into a simple stability model, and you're figuring out how much time uh, does that dam, dam experience where the load succeed at the resistances. So we can use that information to figure out how, how far downstream has that dam shifted. So if that dam has shifted, say, 12 inches downstream during the earthquake, well, now your foundation drains are no longer connected to the, uh, in the concrete, they're no longer connected to the foundation drains that are inside the foundation. So again, what do you do with that assumption? Are your drains no longer effective? So oftentimes that is, again, kind of the default conservative assumption. Um, your drains aren't connected, obviously, to the uh, deeper uh, drilled drains, so you're going to lose some efficiency. But do you completely lose all of your drainage efficiency along that concrete rock interface? Uh, Kind of, again, the default assumption right now is yes, but you have to consider all the information, figure out if that's a conservative approach, if it's an appropriate approach, or if there's something else you can do to adjust that risk. So this, this is an example of, say, multiple monoliths. You know, if you directly model the foundation contacts, uh, this would be um, portions of the dam that are in contact with the foundation and which parts of the dam have completely cracked through. So shown in pink here are the sections of the dam that completely crack through. And this is an excellent example of what happens uh, when you have uh, sufficient 3D effects to load share between monoliths. So this right here, I thought it was four, six monoliths. Yeah, I think it's six monoliths. So shown in pink, that, that monolith has lost all contact with the foundation. There was a crack that developed at the heel. It propagated through the foundation. Is this dam going to fail? Well, based on what I'm looking at here, if this is a nonlinear analysis, you still have portions of your, uh, you still have portions of the neighboring monolith still in contact. So that crack didn't propagate through the entire monolith. 
So you have uh, capabilities of those neighboring monoliths to load share with that monolith that has filled. And it's kind of an uncomfortable thought when you have this one monolith that's obviously filled, you weren't conservative with any of the parameters, but its neighbors are still intact. Like, can you rely on those neighbors? And that's, again, another discussion that plays into estimating nodal probabilities for these um, um, event trees. So that was kind of a quick rundown. So sorry, I don't want to keep people here too long. Does anybody have any questions? Anything for Cody? We got one. I'll preface this by saying I'm not a structural engineer, so. There's been a lot of discussion about performance based uh, testing to help calibrate. Um, you know, a lot of these models. Can you speak about that from the course perspective and what you guys are doing or seeing? What what specifically? Uh, when you're doing 3D models. Uh, uh, so, like, whenever we're make, giving estimates for 3D effects, yeah. and we say there's a 50% likelihood or reduction in risk or something? No, not semi-quantitative effects of 3D, but when you're looking at dynamic models um, uh, through finite element analysis and trying to calibrate that, I'm... Calibrate like, it with real-world results? Yes. Performance-based testing, energizing the dam, looking to help calibrate that. I am not aware, but that does not mean somebody somewhere is not doing something in the core. So if we're, if say, normally the process would go, if you, if the 3D effects are saving the day, um, that's typically a reason that you would want to do a nonlinear model where you can directly model the contacts. Um, especially if you have, you know, some strike and dip direction that's uh, providing the bulk of these 3D effects. You know, like if your dam wants to shift downstream, but the regional uh, strike is off axis, right? So that means if it's if your model starts to move downstream, it's really going to slide into its neighbor. Um, no, there's, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't think there's any like physical test to confirm this. Manal, you look like you have. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know how to answer that, and it's late in the day. But um, dyna calibrating a dynamic model, I think, is complex, right? Physical, like in geotech, um, physical models, centrifuge models might be helpful, um, but that's all I got. I think it's really complicated to use performance data to calibrate a dynamic model for loads that we haven't really seen before, time histories, we're not really sure how to apply. So there's a lot of complex calibration that goes into trying to see if we can trust the models to do what we're wanting to do. I don't know, it's not really, it's a non-answer answer. No, that's good, thank you. Any other questions for Cody? All right, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you, Cody.